Hi, everybody. This is Gary Berger from Berger Law. I hope everybody had a good week and is having a good Friday today. Um, this is our, what we call our Ask a Lawyer show, where we um, ask, take people's questions and, and, um, and answer questions folks might have about, um, about different legal issues that come up. And we have a special kind of program today. Um, we have a couple things we're going to announce. We're going to announce a what we call our Instacart winner. Every week we give out a $150 gift certificate to an Instacart winner. And we also have a, um, a, uh, a scholarship we've been doing for about, um, uh, about a, a nine months now. We've, we've done, we do a scholarship every year uh, uh, at the firm. Uh, this year, the scholarship, and it's on, it's on the website, this year the scholarship was um, about how to stop bullying. Uh, we had a young lady from Oklahoma win our um, scholarship from the previous time, uh, which was um, how to uh, stop or try to uh, slow down texting and driving and social media with dr while driving. And she wrote a great ess essay. Uh, she's in school in Oklahoma. Um, a couple questions just to start out that uh, arose uh, this week for me was um, I had a number of lawyers ask me and ask me to share my policies about going back to work. Um, and so our firm is going back to work, to live work. We unmanned our office and we, um, uh, about uh, March 15th, and uh, we have a plan to go back to work. So I thought I'd just tell everybody briefly to answer that question. How are we going to go back to work? The way we're going to go back to work is next week, everybody's going to come in one day. And the following week, we're going to uh, we're going to go in, in each person of the firm is going to go in for two days and we're going to stagger shifts. We're going to have a Monday, Wednesday team. We're going to have a Tuesday, Thursday team. I'm going to come in on Monday and Tuesday along with a couple folks. We have a couple folks who are doing a Wednesday, Thursday. So, and I wrote out an entire program based on uh, the city and the county's uh, 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 recommendations about how to go back to work and what to do when we go back to work. Uh, so um, that's what we're doing. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit of last week. If anybody would like my uh, policy, my Burger Law policy about going back to work, email me at Gary at BurgerLaw.com. I'll be happy to send it to you. You can steal it, pretend it's yours. We have a lot of things about social distancing, working with a mask. If you're not, if you have a door closed, you don't need a mask. We've separated out workstations. Um, we're cleaning. We're making sure that we use masks uh, in the public entryways in the elevators. Um, there's a whole host of things we're doing to make sure that we're listening to appropriate CDC guidelines and, and, and being careful. So, um, uh, and thank you, Connie. I, and I think the schedule will work out. Um, uh, we've, I've had taken, we have a lot of meetings about it. We've had a number of meetings with staff. We've talked to everybody's concerns. You know, the main rule is if you feel sick, don't go to work. There is recommendations to take temperature every day in some type of locations. As a law firm, I don't feel that's necessary. But if you're sick, don't go to work. Practice social distancing at home. Um, clean everything. Uh, and, you know, and I, we, I bought a bunch of those little keys that people use to press buttons in elevators and to open doors and that kind of stuff. So we're using that as well. Uh, I also changed the background. I'm in my son Jordan's room to do this. And he's got, we have Oshi, TJ Oshi, the old TJ Oshi here. And I got a picture from my wedding uh, right here over my shoulder. I figured I'd change it up a little bit, the background up a little bit for this show as well. So I had a couple other questions come up uh, this week. So that's my program. And just generally, I don't want to bore you with all of it. It's about five, six pages long. Um, so if, uh, if you're interested in that, email me at GaryBurgerLaw.com, and I'll be happy to provide it. Um, another question I got from uh, a friend of mine, uh, and I got a lot of these. So I'm a beekeeper, and uh, I have right now I have five hives. I had three at the beginning of the year, and um, I enjoy it. I've been doing it for a few years. Um, 
So very interesting. So I had it actually a bee swarm uh, a number of weeks ago. So and what swarming is is when bee, that's how bees beehives reproduce. What it, what they do is so there's only one queen in a hive. Hive is anywhere from you know two thousand to ten thousand bees. Most of the bees are women, are are, are young ladies, and uh, so it, and there's one queen that's the boss of everybody and, and rule and provides guidance to the bees by pheromones and behavior and different things. So when they want to reproduce, though, the old queen takes about half the bees out and they go out and they swarm onto a branch and then they go look for a new hive. And meanwhile, the hive that they left, about half the bees, they make a new queen. So I had that happen and I was, I, I didn't know if they were going to swarm, but I had a box ready. Anyway, I caught the swarm. I put that on Facebook. A lot of people liked that. It was in a newsletter that I did, which prompted a question from one of my friends uh, that says, how often do you get stung by bees? Um, and how much honey do you make from your bees? So I get stung. So let's answer the questions. I get stung by bees at least every other time I go into my hives. I go into my hives probably once a week in the spring and summer, not very often in the winter, um, once every two weeks. It depends on what maintenance I need to do. Like when I had that swarm, I had to put them in a box and then I had to make a new hive, make a hive. Um, I had to add new frames. I had to provide sugar water to them. Uh, and then I actually split a hive, which is where you take half the hives and you split them. And I took, and went, so then that one old, the old hive that swarmed, they made a bunch of, they made a bunch of queens. And I'll show you a picture of it. You can see the queen cells. Let me see if I can show this to you on here. If you can see that. So they make a bunch of the queen cells in the bottom of this hive. I think if I touch that, it, it moves. Uh, no, that didn't work. Me. Yeah, here, check this out. You can see that. So you can see those bees moving in there. Um, so those are queen cells at the bottom, the big cells at the bottom. And, they, and, when, and when the first queen hatches from the cell, she kills all the other queens because it's kind of like Highlander. There can be only one. So anyway... Uh, I split, I, I took the queen cells off that, put them in a new hive, and, um, and uh, it was very interesting. So that, the, and, and that, and that hive doing great too. So I get stung probably every time or every other time. I'm used to it now, though. I don't wear gloves when I, when I do it, when I work with my hives, because I want to be kind of connected to the bees, and I have a suit. But sometimes, especially if they're not used to me or something, they're not used to me getting in, they get aggravated or they get protective. Um, sometimes I go in and I'm not stung at all, but sometimes I am in the wind, like after they're alone in the winter and you come down and you start messing with their stuff, they get a little bit mad at you. So they do that. How much money do I have? I got 30 gallons of honey, Davey, from one hive last year. Uh, I am going to put my honey, this is a secret. I'm going to put, I'm going to, I'm going to enter my honey's really, really good. And, and, and people love it. And so I'm gonna enter it into the Missouri State Fair this year and see how we do. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, let me look at the, uh, let me look at the, uh, at the uh, Oshi, I know he's gone, Rodney. Let me look, let me look about, let me look. So I can go into all kinds of stuff about beekeeping, I love it. Uh, bees are amazing creatures. They're fascinating creatures. Oh, you know what I did? You know what I did? So a friend of mine called me, since people are asking about bees, and they had a hot, they had a swarm in their bird's nest, and so I went to the bird's nest to their house. I went to the bird's nest, and um, I uh, uh, not a bird's nest, sorry, a bird like a, a square box, a, a birdhouse, and and I. Uh, I took it off and they were swarming all around. I had my suit on and stuff, but they weren't, they weren't bee, they weren't honeybees. So guess how many, um, guess how many Native American species of bees there are in the United States? And I'll let you guys guess on the cam and then I will tell you in a minute. They were another kind of bee. They were, they were actually a bumblebee. I ended up taking them. I moved them to my house. I put them back in my woods. So I saved the bees. I didn't kill them. Even though those aren't honeybees, they deserve to live. And they certainly are part of our ecosystem. So let me get let me get to something. This is ask a lawyer and ain't ask a beekeeper. So let me move on to ask ask answer some questions. Um, here's one from Danielle Pauly. Do I have a workers' compensation claim if I got injured working from home during the COVID pandemic? Um, well, if you're 
That is a great question. Uh, so it's interesting. So usually uh, work comp is pretty tough. If you're at your work site, you, get, you can have a workers' compensation claim. But if you're not, you don't. And even if you're walking into work and leaving work, you do not have a workers' compensation claim. We've got a case right now where our client slipped on ice going into the, going into the bank and we're suing the, uh, the ice and salt company because and they denied his work comp claim. So um, in, ingress and egress, no, I don't think that you have a, uh, uh, so I don't think you have a workers' compensation claim. Um, if it depends on, I mean, if you have carpal tunnel for typing a lot because you're a data entry person, you might, but I, I don't think you really have a workers' compensation claim. Let me go to another couple questions that I had um, as I was, uh, this week as I was getting, as I was getting ready. Um, uh, so honey, so I asked, it's honey, I make, I got about 30 gallons, um, excuse me, 30 pounds last year, 30 pounds. Um, did you know that honey never goes bad? You can leave it around and you can leave it in a jar closed for five years and you take it out and it's the same thing. It's the only thing that doesn't go bad, the only thing you don't have to preserve. Uh, bees make the honey so they can eat over the winter. Did you know like a bee born right now, one of these girl bees, these girls that are hatching right now in my hive, they're going to live 25, probably 30 days, between 25 and 35 days in the spring and the summer. Uh, a bee born in the winter is going to live more like 100 days. Uh, so, because they're really busy, they're out foraging, they're doing stuff. You know, bees can travel like two to three miles from their hive. The, the, the rule is two miles and they'll come straight back there straight to that hive. I have five hives sitting next to each other. They won't go to their neighbor hive. They'll go to the, they'll go to the single hive that they have. Um, uh, so there you go. There's some questions that I had. Um, so the other, the other question that I had, and the other reason why this is a little special, uh, the today's special, is I wanted to talk about a, 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 couple, a couple teasers here. One is I wanted to talk about uh, the protests that are going on and some of the law relating to that. Um, and um, let me ask, answer the question that I posited earlier. There are 400 different species of bees and wasps native to the United States. Honeybees are not native to the United States. A lot of the honeybees that I have are, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot, the queens and the strains come from Italy, uh, from Europe. And there are some Asians too, but the, the honeybees that people use to make honey are well bred to decrease aggressiveness and to maximize honey production. Um, I, so in the course of this, uh, I decided a bunch of years ago that we were going to do a, uh, so then my next question is who won our scholarship? Uh, I decided a bunch of number of years ago that I start, I should kind of give back a little bit. And we start giving scholarships to people. And so we had an amazing, um, an amazing, um, a lot of amazing entries. So here's some quick facts about our scholarship. It was the How to Stop Bullying Scholarship, and generally how to stop bullying for kids in grades grade six, six through 12. We know that bullying is a huge problem. It causes emotional distress in kids. Uh, it's something that has been a uh, thorn in the side for years. I know Obama had a stop bull and 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 uh, uh, Barack and 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 uh, the, the president and, and the first lady had a, a a a campaign to try to stop bullying, which kind of inspired me. Um, and we don't hear about it as much lately, uh, but um, it's a real problem. Uh, the scholarships for two thousand dollars. They must be enrolled and are planning to go into a university. We received the same number of submissions as there are bees in the United States. We received more than 400 submissions for our, for our scholarship. We reviewed these, judging them on creativity, originality, efficacy, the ability for a solution to be implemented for, um, for to, to stop bullying, to actually stop bullying. And um, so, uh, what I would like to do now, if I can, if it works, and this may not work, um, is call the recipient. Um, so um, let me try to do that right now, live on the air. This is one of these things where I don't know if radio show hosts really do these things anymore, 
or TV persons. Remember when Geraldo tried to go find the, uh, like he had this whole thing to try to find this, I think what was the King Tut's tomb or something? And he did this whole thing and he went in there, he didn't find anything, it was a total, uh, total waste. Um, I think I got the right number, let me call her um, and see if she's available. Um, I think she is, we called her earlier. Hey, Tiffany, how you doing? Hey, this is Gary Berger, Berger Law. I know we we text you good. Hey, I wanted to tell you that we've chosen you as our scholarship recipient. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hey, I got, can I ask you something weird? So can I put, so I, I happen to do a Facebook live show and I happen to be doing it now. And I was wondering if I could talk to you a little bit on speakerphone about your entry. That's kind of you. All right, I'm putting you on speakerphone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, hopefully the people at home can hear us. The people on at home at Facebook live can hear us. So, so Tiffany, tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, so my name is Tiffany, I grew up in the Midwest. I'm from the Chicagoland area. I uh, grew up on the south side of Chicago. I went to Davidson College down south in North Carolina for college. Studied chemistry there and was pre-medicine. Um, and if you don't know where that is, that's where Seth Curry went to school. Um, right. All the college is pretty well known. Yeah. And then now I'm back in Chicago. I'm working and I'm preparing to go to medical school this coming fall. So I actually start next month. I love it. I really like, I saw your, you know, you shared with us your transcript and what you tell me, what you really, you look to me to be a really hard worker. What kind of work do you do outside, not in school? What are you doing right now? Yeah, so actually I work in sales right now, which is very interesting coming from the science and the medical healthcare background. And I really wanted something a little different because I knew that had the rest of the, my life to kind of pursue medicine and healthcare, so I wanted a, a, something a little bit different. Kind of broadened my, you know, career skills, my personal, my professional skills. So I decided to enter the sales field, very competitive, um, just like you know, medicine is. So just trying to pick up new skills while I can during these gap years before I go into medical school. And then on the side, I kind of do a lot more volunteering. I'm big on volunteering. I saw um, that. Yeah, right now I'm not actually volunteering because of the pandemic going on, but before the pandemic started, I worked in the emergency department at Northwestern um, Memorial Hospital in downtown Chicago. I also worked on the south side of Chicago at a food pantry uh, that served HIV and AIDS patients. So, you know, gathering food for them and kind of, you know, listening to their diet and kind of editing their diet to, you know, improve their health, their physical health. One of the things that I liked about your submission, and we had over 400 submissions uh, for this, is this, this idea of role-playing scenarios in class settings to try to teach people about bullying. Because, you know, the interesting thing about, and I, I'm no expert on bullying, but, you know, um, uh, we, every, no one says bullying is good. There's, there's, there's general right. condemnation of bullying. That, that's not in dispute. But, you know, it's where the rubber hits the road in these decisions that are made on a daily basis. You know, one person's bullying, maybe someone else is sticking up from their friends. And how do you know when you intervene? And how do you know when you're right. trying to stick? What's the line between standing up for yourself in a difficult situation as a teen or a preteen versus, um, right. versus, uh, versus being a bully and going over the line? Because, you know, as I'm right. older... And I, you know, I, you know, I, I look over at my life, and I, I know times where I've stood up for my friends and been appropriate, but maybe I've gone over the line before too. And I'm also a trial lawyer, um, so I can be, you know, I do depositions, and I have a job to persuade yeah. people. And I'm going to let you talk in a minute. But the other thing is, one of the reasons I always say the reason why I do what I do is because I hate bullies, and this is one of the reasons why I did this scholarship. And so. I think when I stand up, when I represent people and stand up to corporations or insurance companies or that kind of stuff, I always think that I'm fighting the big bullies in the world and trying to help the, 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 the everyday people. So, but enough of my speech. How'd you come up with the role-playing scenario idea and why do you think that would be efficacious in addressing bullying in high school and middle school? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think personally for me, so growing up, I kind of grew up in the social media era. So that's when, you know, MySpace came about, Facebook. 
Facebook, Instant Messenger. That was my time in the 90s. Um, and I guess no one really saw that coming and, coming and also the negative effects coming with social media, which is uh, mind-bullying. Um, no one really thought, you know, like someone would actually go online, hide behind a screen, and attack someone else. And also no one really, you know, like in the 90s and going into the 2000s, mental health was very stigmatized and still is right now, you know. So for people to realize the negative effects, it was, it was difficult for anyone to predict that to happen. Um, and personally for me, I actually went through bullying in middle school, uh, like about fifth, sixth, seventh grade and also online bullying and it was hard to figure out who was doing it because it's through it's through the screen you know you can't you know figure that out easily um so when I thought about role playing I thought more so if someone could actually see that live happening that it could change their mind about what you know if they're bullying someone it could really open their eyes to the impact that they're making that negative impact and I've also known people not personally, but I've heard on media that people have committed suicide, gone into severe depression, drug abuse, um, and, you know, a combination of other issues. And it's not really easy to recover from and kind of bounce back from that. So I think it's important to um, have that role playing and, and be able to open the eyes of people that aren't aware of the negative impacts. And I think role playing would be, you know, a great opportunity for people to learn that way. And that's how people in, uh, yeah, and, you know, they say, I read one of the statistics in your and other papers that the, is that half of all uh, teen suicides involve bullying. And we've read, we've right. read really sad stories about that in the media. But, um, right. um, and then, and, you know, we learn through, um, you know, we, people learn well through mimicking behavior. And you can sit and watch a lecture and do stuff, but until you actually do things and take action that's when a lot of these lessons uh get more get more ingrained in us and we remember them more is that right. you think that is that a why role playing in it in it why role playing why is that a, a effective you know i do agree with what you specifically stated about what people do like they mimic behavior that they see and so in school like you might be following a friend who you look, who you specifically look up to that's bullying someone else. And then you take that behavior, you incorporate that into yourself, and then you start doing those actions. I almost see it as if, you know, when you're talking to your friends, you start picking up on their lingo because you're just around them so much. And I see that almost in actions too, how someone acts around you. If it's someone, especially someone you see on a daily basis, you start incorporating and picking up those actions yourself and then doing that and carrying that out. So I think when it comes to role playing, if you could see, you know, behavior, positive behavior, um, then you start to reflect on that and reflect on your own behaviors. And I think especially in middle school and high school, that's when you really develop how you want to act and, you know, develop your own um, personal actions and also your thought process changes throughout middle school, high school, and that's where it really solidifies. And so also high school and middle school, middle school students are very, uh, like, modifiable or you, you can mold them into... They're coachable. Like, right, they're coachable, they're coachable. So... I think role playing and having positive examples set in front of you that some students might not receive depending on the neighborhood you grew up in, the school you go to, whether it's public or private, you might not have those positive examples already set out for you. So I think it's important to incorporate that into, you know, any school you go to so that everyone has that uh, role model to kind of, or that role playing and the examples set in front of them. Yeah. You know, and, and ki so, yeah, kids those ages, their brains are even less developed than people know, think, you know. People see that, right. people see a right. big body, but they don't realize that the brain and the maturity level of development is, is, right. uh, is lagging behind. And then the thing, too, is that through doing this, people will learn behavior. You, you, people don't know what to do. How, how do you diffuse a situation? How do you get out of it how do you don't need to you don't need to respond to the fight the, the 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 only way to win is not to engage walk away um right. make a joke out of it all those things you learn maybe later in life it's good to learn those early you know it's interesting that and then you also have uh, you point out your your essay about being proactive and and punishment doesn't work you know the, the other thing i was thinking while we were talking is um 
you know, this, some of this be, some of these, this behavior in these protests that are happening right now with police officers. I mean, I think police officers have a tough job, uh, certainly, uh, but people are also entitled to peacefully protest. And, you know, maybe some of these off, like I saw that officer hit that 75 year old guy and put him on the ground yesterday. And I was just thinking about you and your essay, yeah. you know, I mean, you, that, you know, the lessons to everybody about how to diffuse situations and not engage might be, might be good. It, it, it transcends just the bullying issue. It goes to life a little bit. Right, exactly, yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm big on being proactive about situations and not reactive. And even just like in general in life, I always look before the situation occurs or before this event occurs, I plan for it. And so, so that you kind of, you, you can expect the unexpected and plan ahead for it. And so it, that it goes well with bullying too. So right. Instead of reacting to bullying and punishing people for bullying um, and having people go kind of do it, go on a downward spiral before you actually help them. Why not do that beforehand? You know? Great, great, great. All right, Tiffany, thanks for talking to me. That's all I got. Um, we're gonna okay, we're, okay. we're gonna email you. We will we will get you the check for the two thousand dollars scholarship. We usually in the past we've paid it directly to the school, but where we work out, we'll work that out with you. You have our email and our stuff. Thanks so much for entering. Thanks so much for your hard work and diligence, and uh, and uh, in life and in this. And we wish you the very very best. Thank you. So much. I appreciate it. All right, cool. Hey, thanks for taking my call and doing this too. Thank you. No problem. All right, be good. Bye. All right. So, what an interesting lady. What a what a boy. How lucky are we that she's going to be a doctor and go in to serve others? Um, so, uh, congratulations to Tiffany. Um, let me take some more questions because this is Ask a Lawyer, and I want to keep on trucking. And thanks everybody for listening to that discussion. I thought it was interesting. Um, so I have another question. Are, are curfews enforceable? So, 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 so we, we, we segued a little bit in talking with Tiffany to these protests that are going down on now. And right now, literally right now, my wife just texted me, there is a protest going on by my house. Um, and, uh, my wife and my son just texted me. They walked, literally left my house. They walked out to Clayton Road and they brought tambourines and flutes to cheer the protesters. And there is a peaceful protesting march down Clayton Road near my house, which started at, the, at, a, at a library and is going to go for a ways. And um, we've done that. My wife and I and, and, and our kids have, have done marches over the last three or four years or so. Um, my son has some uh, protest signs here every once in a while in, in his room too. So uh, that's going on literally right now and I could point to where it is within a, a two minute walk from my house. Um, so how, what's the law on protests? Uh, what's, are police entitled to hit people and beat them up if they're protesting? Are they entitled to, you know, wh where are the lines on that in the law? So, the, so we have the right in America, you know, the First Amendment, we have the right to free speech and assembly, right? So we have the right, Americans have the right to speak and to march and to protest and to say things. That's, that was in America, that's what America is all about. Um, that's our First Amendment. That's one of the we're the first country to protect that and the first country to do that. That's part of our story tradition in America. And, and, but we also at the same time have a troubled history with that. We have a troubled history of, of the government forces act, overreacting and di taking disproportionate action to quash protests and quash free, free speech. Uh, the Kent State, uh, the, the, the 50th anniversary of the Kent State killings, those four kids uh, 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 who, who, who were, you know, who were killed. Uh, we have, we have, we have people killed all, we have, we have a bad history of the civil rights movement of pe people being killed. Um, at the same time, 
what is very difficult for law enforcement. It is very difficult to be a police officer in America. We all have to acknowledge that as well. It's very, it's even more difficult, I think, to be an African-American and be an African male in America as well. Um, uh, that, that man who was, who was kneeled on and killed is just terrible. So, um, and suffocated to death. Um, but there are also many good cops. There are very many good police officers that protect and serve. And, you know, if you talk to any officer making some of these decisions at night, you know, patrolling and stuff is very difficult. Where's the line? Now, the, where people correctly protest and, and complain is when there's no question the line's going over. And it wasn't a close call on that kind of stuff. You can't, you can't sit on and kill people. You can't do this. You can't even get close to that. It, the, the conduct is crazy. But it is, it, it is difficult to be an officer. So there's this tension here. There's a tension in responding to protests. There's a tension in policing. There's a tension in civil rights. There's a tension between those things, both de facto and de jure, which means both in the facts and, as, and in the law, as I see it. So, so you have the right to protest. Everybody who's marching right now has the right to protest. But, but at the same time, you don't have the right to loot and commit crimes and break in and, and, and commit crimes, which, is, which, has been ruined, which has been cast a long shadow on the protest, which can cast a shadow on the protest. It did in Ferguson as well, six or seven years ago. Um, so there's that line, and, and I think the officers, so you can't, you know, obviously you, and I think we all know what the line is. I don't even know if it's a legal question. You can't commit a crime, you can't do that, but you have the right to protest. And um, hopefully we will better balance those two things. Hopefully that will happen better in the future. How does it happen? It happens through training, through police officer training. One of the good things that came out of the Michael Brown uh, 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 murder and, and uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the bad actions by, I think, St. Louis County Police and other police departments around the country that it's repeating now. I thought it the good things that had happened. Uh, different commissions about training. Training officers to where that line is. Training officers not to go over that line, and and I I don't I don't, I don't know if we lost that since then. Um, we may have. Um, so, uh, but like that officer in New York, those officers should have been trained. You don't need to push down peaceful protesters who are coming up to talk to you. You don't need to do that. You, this is this is America. People have a people have a right to tell officers things. You have a right to tell government officials things. We have that right. Um, so that's, I know I, I was kind of going around, but, but look, that's, that's the line. You have the right to protest. You don't have the right to commit crimes. Officers have the right to protect people and property, but they don't have a right to assault and attack people. These use of these rubber bullets when, in peaceful protesting, the clearing out of that church in Washington, D.C., ridiculous, inappropriate, and I think unlawful conduct. Um, but, and, 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 I, and it's my Facebook live show, so I get to say that. And people have asked me that. So that's the answer to those questions. Let me go through my comment section here again and go through the questions to kind of get down to business. Um, um, and while I do, I wanted to announce my Instacart winner. As everybody knows, we have this Instacart winner. We give $150 scholarship every week. This week, $150 scholarship, $150, I misspoke, $150 Instacart uh, gift certificate that can be used to have food delivered or use at Aldi's and stuff. This week, we're, gonna, we're granting that and giving that to Donna Sue Perkins. Donna Sue Perkins, message us on Facebook. Give us your, give us, and we'll message you as well right now. Give us your zip code and you'll get that. Um, we're going to change some things up in this Ask a Lawyer down the road. If anybody has a recommendation for a small business or someone in the area you'd like us to support rather than Instacart, we're looking for good ideas. And so please leave a comment of a local business that we could like get a gift certificate from and, and, and give next time. So I, we are trying to do Instacart as a, re, as a established means to get people food because of the pandemic now that there's, the, although we're still social distancing, now that things are opening up, we thought we'd change it 
and, and, and support some local businesses as well. So we'd like any ideas. The second thing we're gonna change is, we're thinking about changing the time and, and the day of the week. Cause I don't know if people on Friday afternoons, I don't know if they're, we, we're, we're thinking about doing that. So watch for that. Um, uh, so, uh, so congratulations to Donna Sue Perkins. Um, let me go to another question that I have. Um, Brennan asked, do I have a claim if I'm assaulted by your bees on your property? No, you're not. You do not have a claim against me. How do you know it's my bees? Bees travel two miles. It could be anybody's bees. Um, and a bee, and, and a bee, can, a bee is defending itself. The only time a bee stings you is when it defends itself. And if the bee stings you, it's going to die. So when a bee stings you, it, it's stinger and its lower abdomen pulls out, except for the queen. The queen can sting and live and, and sting a bunch of times. But, but so does my bee have a claim against you for causing you to sting it? I don't know. Um, but no, you do not have that claim against me. Um, just to lighten it up a little bit. I know we're talking about heavy subjects like bullying and race and, 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 and being a police officer. Uh, David asks, if my business or storefront was damaged by protesters, would this apply? What, what do you do? So there are businesses that are wrecked. There was, uh, I saw pictures of, um, uh, uh, I saw pictures of storefronts uh, in downtown St. Louis wrecked. I know the storefronts in South Grand are boarded up. I think they're, they're boarding up before, because last, it, we went down there uh, after trying to patronize the restaurants there. Uh, they boarded them up after Ferguson protests, but they also, I think they pre-boarded them up before things get broken, so good for them. So what, if you're a business or storefront and it's damaged, you have an insurance policy that will cover you. My wife's asking me if I'll bring masks. She wants me to come over to the protest here and bring masks for her and my kid, and I'm going to do that. Uh, do you have a, do you, what, what do you do? So you, you should have commercial insurance. You should have insurance for the property damage for your windows, for your boards. You should, they should pay for the wood to do it, they, to, to put up instead in place of your window. They should pay up cleanup. Just like when there's a flood, they pay for ServPro or someone to come out to, to do the water. They should pay for the, they should pay for that. Um, uh, and you make a call your insurance agent, make a claim. The other thing though, is you're gonna be out for the count for a while. So you have a claim for your loss of business income. That's part of your claim. So you would make what's called a business interruption claim to your insurance company and say that you had this thing happen and you can't open for three weeks. And you give them your, your payroll and your other stuff and you say what your business income was and or your, your, your tax return or you give them your profit and loss statement from your QuickBooks, whatever you give them, you prove your, you prove your profit, net profit, and you should have a claim for your net profit. It's very similar to, go to the Burger Law Business Interruption Insurance Claim page. We have all the, a lot of the law on it. We have what the policies typically say. And we also have how our insurance companies typically deny those. We represent people for claims. I got, just literally got an email right before I started here about that about someone having a claim wanting us to help them because it, they got denied. I'm gonna move this light so I get a little bit more light on my face um, so y'all can make sure y'all can see me. So um, so if the, if the insurance company denies you, you want to, first you wanna make a claim, you wanna file a proof of loss claim, you wanna make a claim with your insurance company, both for the property damage as well as your, as your business income loss. If they deny you, they'll send you a long letter from insurance company, from insurance company lawyer law firm saying, here's all the reasons why we're denying you, blah, 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 blah. And they'll, they'll quote parts of it, but don't believe them because that's not necessarily true. And, and then, and, and uh, send those to me at Gary at burgerlaw.com. We'll answer your questions for free, answer your questions for free. We will tell you whether or not we think we have a claim that we, we would either represent you on a contingency fee basis or some other way. So if you get denied, we find insurance companies all the time. I like fight, fighting bullies. I happen to think insurance companies are often bullies. I like fighting them. I like standing up for people and getting them what, because if you pay insurance premiums for a contract with an insurance company for years, and then you have a claim, they ought to pay that claim. They, ought, they shouldn't screw you over. Um, I think that I 
answered that claim, David. Let me see what other claims I got on my feed here. Uh, someone says there's 4,000 species, Deborah says. She Googled the species of bees. You know, see what native number of native species in America. It could be 4,000. I could be totally wrong. I just got a pool. Here's Kira's question. I just got a pool. What are the liability issues um, if someone is injured while swimming in my gated yard without my permission? Uh, without your permission, they're a trespasser, and they typically, so, so if someone gets injured, if, if, you have a, if you have a premises liability claim, the law divides the claim, are they an invitee, a licensee, or a trespasser? If they're an invitee, you brought them, you have to protect them from any dangers you knew or could have known. So if you go into a store, the store sh could know that there's a, someone spilled a shake on the floor, or that there's ice on the parking lot, you, they're liable. If they're a licensee, that's the same as an invitee. They have a license or an implied license to come in. Uh, not like a literally like a driver's license, but an implied license. If you're a trespasser, you have less rights. Uh, you don't, you, 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 so you would not, if you drive, if you, if someone does pool hopping and drowns in your pool, I do not think you would be liable. That doesn't mean they won't make a claim or try to sue you, but I think you would have a very good defense, and I think you would probably win on a summary judgment motion. They'd throw the case out of court before it ever went to a lawyer. Remember, though, that as part of your homeowner's insurance, your insurance company provides you two to two things, main two things. They they have to have they have a duty to indemnify, mean paying the claim, but they also have a duty to defend you. And the duty to defend is different than the duty to indemnify. It is broader. So. If you get sued for a homeowner's claim, they have a duty to hire a lawyer, pay for a lawyer, give you a vigorous defense to protect you. Um, so that's what they would do for that. I deal with this all the time. Um, so there you go. That answer, I think I answered your question, Kira. The liabilities, but I've done swimming pool cases, but you know, so but if they're if they're a guest at your home, you have a duty to have a safe pool. You have a duty to provide adequate supervision at your pool. You can't let a bunch of kids go, young kids swim at your pool and not be there to help them and, and protect them. We read sad stories every spring about this. And we also remember all the, all, every year, so I was, we were at the Merrimack River the other day doing a hike with my family. And the water was high. We stayed away from it. Every year we hear about people drowning in, in rivers. And I'm a, I'm a scuba diver. I'm a cave diver. I'm a scuba instructor i do a ton of scuba scuba diving a lot of swimming all that stuff i'm very familiar with the with the water people don't understand or appreciate the power of water water is very powerful and very dangerous you got to be careful with it always so there's your if there's one takeaway be very careful around water um so you have a duty to supervise a duty to have a safe place you can't have too shallow a pool where someone would go in and break their neck so if you get an above ground pool, Kira, you said you got a pool. There's a bunch of these cases I've represented. If you have an above ground pool, you've got to put it, buy a sign on Amazon, put it up and tell people don't dive. You can't dive into a pool. So if things look a third, think visually, water displaces, water changes sound and it changes vision. So things are a third closer than they appear in water. But if you're standing to dive in, pools, to people, pools look artificially deep. So people think they can dive in when they can't, when they cannot. So people will dive in and they will, they will and their arms won't prevent them. They'll hit their necks on a pool and they will snap their head back and they will break their neck. It's very sad. It happens. Do not dive in any, don't dive in an above ground pool. Don't don't dive in a below ground pool unless you know that it's 10 or 12 feet. You're not that you should not be diving in there unless and unless you have experience in diving, like diving, not scuba diving, but diving off a board, diving on the side. Unless you're experienced, you know, person, you know, as soon as you when you get in the water, I was on a dive team in high school, what or whatever, not high school. I wasn't good enough for them before that. Uh, uh, you know how to dissipate your downward energy. Until you know that, don't be diving in anywhere. Be very careful about that. All right, let me go through some more questions. I'm going through my comments. I don't get the Jimmy Hoffa comment, but yeah, no, I think I do. Are curfews enforceable the city is doing? 
Would I be liable if I'm out in public late at night? Curfews are enforceable and you will get a ticket and have to pay a ticket if you're out in the public, if you're out late at night. It's, this is, there's an, I read an article this morning about how much this is impacting, um, you know, workers, like, you know, the restaurant workers or other people. You're finally back to work. You're finally waiting tables, cooking, washing dishes at the restaurant. I had a lot of restaurant jobs growing up. I did a ton of them. I have a lot of respect for those people. And you, uh, and you, um, and now you're getting pulled over because they think you're violating curfew. What a pain. But, and so the curfews are enforceable. They can keep public order. There's one in downtown St. Louis right now or in St. Louis because of all the stuff that's been happening. I personally think they're appropriate. If people are going to get out of control and start looting and pillaging and breaking windows in businesses, you need to control that and curb that behavior a period of time. It, it, is it a restraint on your liberty? Yes, it is. But the government's entitled to restrain your liberty in measured and appropriate and reasonable ways. A curfew is one. And so you're liable, not like criminally liable, not, not like civilly liable, but you are liable for, um, uh, for the ticket that they're going to give you or an arrest that they could, or they, they could make. Um, Adam Houston points about de-escalation being an important skill for everyone from police officers to parents. Yes, it is. De-escalation is, did you ever hear that? Never get in an argument at night. Wait till the next morning with your spouse or anybody else. Wait till the next morning because the next morning, things seem different. The thing you were pissed off about the night before or all stressed about, who cares, right? Because you got a good night's sleep, you're relaxed. You know, we're, humans are emotional beings, emotional creatures. And sometimes as you get older, you need to curb that, control that emotion. Sometimes I'm good at that, sometimes I'm bad. I'm all Irish, uh, so, but I work on that stuff. We all work on that. Um, uh, here's a question. If I post something on social media that a business or business owner said did something racist and effectively convince others to stop patronizing their company, can I be sued? Does it matter if I back up my claim with a specific screenshot or example versus just stating my opinion generally? So the answer is yes, you can. You, it's, it's, it's slander and libel. So we have slander and libel laws in America. Um, libel, is, slander is an oral telling of something. Libel is a print telling of something. Days of social media, what is it? Well, it's not printed, but it is, is written, typed out and out there. And this happens, and I've gotten calls on these types of cases before, um, because a slanderous false statement on Twitter, Facebook, wherever here can be really damaging to people. It can ruin people and people have to be careful with their accusations. They're barely, very, they can be very carefully, excuse me, I misspoke. They can be very cavalierly made, especially in the last three and a half years um, um, with some, with our, with our president changing the nature of what media, I don't want to be a Trump basher, but the, 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 the our president has changed the nature of media and what's true and fake news and makes allegations against people, then he reverses himself. And so, but you gotta be careful of what you say about bullying on social media and saying false statements of social media. So if you would make a face, false statement of somebody that uh, their business was bad in some way, racist, anti-gay, anti-Christian, anti-whatever, Cause them that they could sue, cause them a loss of business. They could sue you for that. That would not be a business interruption claim in insurance. They could sue you for that. But a defense to libel and slander is truth. So if you say something and you can prove it is truth, then and if it is true, if it's one of those crazy cake decorating places that decide that they they're not going to serve um, uh, uh, gay couples. Uh, then, and if that's true, it's true. You can't sue them. So that is that. Um, and you can't just say it's your opinion. Uh, you can't just say, oh, it wasn't the truth. It was just my opinion. Well, you can state your opinion, but it depends on what you said. So be judicious with your threats and protests. Be judicious of that. Don't even say that stuff on social media. Who needs to hear that? And, and why do they care? No offense. Why do they care about your opinion anyway? Who are you? I'm just joking. I mean, you, I, I know who you are. You're a good person, but why do people think that 
they need to weigh their opinions and views on everything these days. What are they, some scholar? Uh, I, I, I do say things on some things and I say my political opinions, but I'm not here to, um, I'm not here to preach to people. I'm not here to, anyway. Uh, that was how America was founded. Under the, exactly. Deborah points out. Yeah, I was going to say this before, but protesting, uh, you know, protesting is how we started America. We protested against it. Remember the Boston Tea Party? Well, there you go. That was a protest. So we had, we had, remember Thomas Paine's common sense? That was a written protest. Remember all this? And, and I mean, unless people protest, you know, uh, uh, all, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Government has it. The, the, the go, remember, remember um, the remember. Tom, is it Thomas Paine or or government's best that governs least? Uh, you know when these go, when these police come in and these heavy-handed tactics come in, do, should they protect businesses from getting burned? Absolutely. Should they go up beat up peaceful protesters? No way. Not even close. So protesters are important and do you know one of the things i like can, so can i tell you a great try and i know i'm going to get off soon but let me tell you a trial lawyer story so do you know our third president was john adams i think he was our third president wasn't he um john our president john adams and here you get you're gonna laugh at me on my president history do you know why john adams was such a great trial lawyer our our president is what i do um he defended criminally defended the, 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 the British officers that fired on the Americans at the boss's tea parties. They killed those Americans. And he was a, one of the things he did was a criminal defensor. And he believed that everybody had a right to a, a fair trial and a vigorous defense. And he went and defended them and he won. He, he made sure they did not, no, no, the, the captain went to jail, but the underlings, the, the sergeant went to jail, but the other, the, but the other folks didn't because they were just following orders. So that's what trial lawyers do for people. And that's what trial lawyers do for protesters, defend their right to protest. Um, uh, are the looter, are the other looters that, Bob Guller has a great question. Are the looters at Lee's Pawn Shop guilty of murder even if they weren't the shooter? They can be. So there's a rule in criminal law called the felony murder rule. And if you are with someone and, 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 and they commit murder and you also commit a crime in the same instance or ball of facts as that, and I have other criminal defense, criminal defense and criminal prosecutor friends who can answer this better than me, then you are also guilty of murder. So if you're, you and your three buddies go in and rob a bank and one of your buddies shoots and murders someone, you can also be prosecuted for that murder. So are the, the other looters are doing that. Now that's the felony murder rule. I don't know if you're doing a misdemeanor as a looter, you can't. But if, but if you're doing burglary and that's a felony, those people can be convicted of that murder as well. Um, and I saw the picture of that, uh, the, the person they're charging with that crime uh, and uh, today, um, uh, and uh, Brennan asked Filoni's. I'm not sure about that. Any update on the DOC lawsuit? No update. Uh, there was a hand down date from the Supreme Court, but they did not render a decision on this case. So there's been no decision in the Department of Corrections um, property. Michael asked me, can a beehive on my property be considered an attractive nuisance? It could be to a bear. Um, uh, but um, so an attra what attractive nuisance is, is that is that so I talked about trespassers and stuff uh, earlier, and I'm going to end this show in in four minutes. So I'm going to get through the rest of my questions. Um, uh, and so you can't have an, a, a new a dangerous conditions that attracts people. So if you have a really cool pool with a bunch of balloons on it and a cool slide and you have a bunch of kids who live next door, they're going to be attracted to that pool. So you have to create a barrier. So you can't have something attractive that would, that would, uh, thank you, Alex, about the bow tie. It's pretty sweet. I tie my own bow ties and have for a long time. Thank you, Alex. So you can't have an attractive nuisance. If you have attractive nuisance, they're not trespassers. They're, in, they're invitees. And then it changes the standard care and the jury instruction 
that is provided. Nine extraordinary facts about bees have been posted. Boy, whoever is from David, you are on this. And and uh, and uh, and Brennan is on this. I love the maintenance of this. Dustin, how are you? Um, hey, I do. <laughs> so Dustin, I see is so Dustin's one of my die buddies. Dustin, did you get your cave card? Because I thought I saw a picture of you at either peacock or orange um, the other day on Facebook. So Dustin's a great diver. I have a lot of dive buddies, um, um, and. Dustin moved to Florida, and there's a, two great cave dives in, in Florida in the same area called Peacock and Orange. I think the picture that you put up was of Orange because of all the growth, of the, all the bad growth. So us cave divers, we get in underwater, we go in these underground rivers, and they're really tight spaces, and we do all this crazy shit. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that on Facebook Live. But anyway, and so, but a lot of my crazy dive friends are very politically different than me. I'm kind of a progressive guy. I wear these liberal bow ties and stuff. Although, you know what? Conservatives wear these too. I got my Southern conservative suit on today. And one of my buddies put a Trump sticker on the bottom of one of my scuba tank and I didn't know it for a year and they thought it was the funniest thing. And yes, I do have those stickers on because I said to myself, I didn't notice the stickers for like a year. I have all these stickers on my tank and they're mostly Grateful Dead this and I'm a vegetarian and I do all this liberal crap, uh, but they were, they thought it was very funny and, but they're also good friends and good divers of mine, but, and it was hilarious. It was great. Uh, and I've kept it on. It's kind of to humble me, to keep it, keep me humble. Cause remember everybody's got a different opinion in life and just mine ain't necessarily right. Although it is. Um, all right. Deborah Ferris. Do I have a question about your weekly giveaways? Locals or statewide or national? Deborah, it's national. It's national, Deborah. I'll give I'll give it anywhere. I will give um, I will give I will give it anywhere. If you're a if we end up choosing you, it's absolutely um, absolutely we're we're not uh, we're not um, uh, we're not being um, local only. Although most of the folks who know me and my firm are local, although I do stuff all over the country. Um, all right, uh, Adam Houston says thanks for the answer. Henry David Thoreau. Why is Henry David Thoreau answered questions? Um, ah, so Henry, oh, the, the, that government which get best governs least, Henry David Thoreau. So you want to know a great story about Henry David Thoreau? So Henry David Thoreau, um, you know, he wrote Civil Disobedience. And we, we, we cite it. It's also sometimes credited Jefferson or Locke. I thought it was Jefferson. But anyway. So, so Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson were buddies, two, you know, two of America's great writers, great poets. And so Thoreau protested the Mexican-American War. And the way he protested the Mexican-American War was he stopped paying his taxes. It's not the Second Amendment, Rodney. It's the first. Oh, Adams was the second president. Yes. Um, sorry. Thank you. And then Jefferson third. Thank you. So. So uh, Henry David Thoreau did not pay his taxes and they put him in jail for it. And so, so you can't protest to the government by not paying your taxes. That has been ruled on. You can march, but you've got to pay your taxes. So, um, so Emerson went and visited him and Emerson said, said, what are you doing in there? And, and Thoreau looked at him without missing a beat, said, what are you doing out there? Meaning to Emerson is that if you truly believed if, if you had the courage of your convictions, you'd do what I do and you'd protest and you'd get arrested. And it was a great point of civil disobedience. Um, uh, the main thrust of that quote is that the idea of the government should not intervene in the lives of citizens any more than necessary, which is true. Um, so I have other questions here. I love everybody uh, uh, doing this. Can we expect a different bow tie every week? I got a lot of bow ties, so the answer is yes. Um, and here's the, some surveillance video of the person who, of these other looters, a very, 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 very sad what happened to that, that poor man. You know, that man was a police sergeant and devoted his life to helping people and a 75 year old man killed like that is terrible. Oh, Dustin was at orange, not at Peacock. I thought it was orange. I said that before I saw that. Um, 
tropical bow tie next week. Yes, I'm going to move through these other questions. Thank you very much. I love all the comments. Listen, folks, it's been an hour. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. It's 5 o'clock here. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Look for our show next week. Congratulations to our winners today. Congratulations to Donna Sue Perkins for the, for the, uh, uh, for the Instacart. And uh, Tiffany Rowan, it was really a pleasure talking to you. Uh, you're really an insightful person. I really enjoyed talking to you about bullying and some ideas to stop it. All right, everybody, thanks. Have a great weekend.